All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Raymond Jett. I was one of the uh, lead volunteers and key holder at a wonderful, magical place called Computer Reset. It was magical, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you never knew what you were going to find in different boxes, different rooms. So I'm Noelle Yingling. I'm the daughter of Richard Byron, who started Computer Reset. So um, it was definitely, uh, thank you, that helps, <laughs> definitely quite an experience. Um, never thought I would have to deal with all this. Oh, does that change it? Yeah. Okay. Never thought I'd have to deal with all this. Always thought my sister would take care of it, but she <laughs> passed away and that was not an option. So she lived in Houston. I live in South Carolina. So um, when all this came to be and, and I learned about how bad it was, I was lucky enough to have you know, one person start looking into all this and, and putting videos up on YouTube, but at that time I didn't really know what we were dealing with, so we had all the videos shut down and took a step back and formulated a volunteer team and a plan. So, and then the, the sale started. So clean up, lots and lots of clean up, lots and lots of dumpsters, dumpster juice, which you'll learn about later. Uh, <laughs> Um, just, uh, it was Foul bad. smelling. Uh, just, I can still smell that place just looking at these pictures. That's, and that's no joke. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> so this is the storefront. I'm sure most of you have either heard of it or been there yourself. So this is the storefront before we boarded it up due to burglaries and people trying to come in when they should not come in. We needed to secure the building because nobody was really there except on the weekends. So, so how many of you shopped there before? And how many of you had uh, come to the liquidation events? Awesome. <laughs> That's kind of what I expected. How many volunteers do we have in the room? <laughs> we have quite a few of our volunteers here. All the volunteers are well beyond volunteers at this point. They're family. They're really good friends. I mean, when you sweat together that much and do as much nasty stuff as we did, you're family. <laughs> you know, when COVID hit, everybody started turning back into feral human beings. <laughs> it, was, it was so nice to have a place to go, to hang out with friends, and just, you know, play in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of dirt. <laughs> So this is a picture I took on, I think it was January 1st one year. There was nobody there, so I took a picture before he took the sign down. So. so it all started with my dad, who's here in this picture. Um, he grew up in Oklahoma City. He was very well educated. He got his engineering degree, got a JD degree, worked for Boeing, Dresser Industries, and ARCO. Learned about the political life, just that was not flying well with him. He was he just wanted more to do his own thing. So he started Computer Reset. Started it actually in our house. And I can't tell you as a teenager how many times I woke up to tape being dispensed in the washroom right behind my room. You know, I'm like, that's, no. <laughs> so that's kind of where he started it. Yes, the tape rollers. I'm like, oh, gosh. So that's where he started it. So, and went to, like, sidewalk sales and the first Friday sales, um, the um, Vicon, Vicon Flea Market, flea market um, started over there, ran it out of the house. So um, our little family was obviously my dad, my mom, and my sister and I. So just the four of us. So that's us actually on a boat deep sea fishing. So in the Gulf of Mexico, one of our favorite activities. So um, he started it in 1984. I was 12 years old. I didn't, couldn't care less, right? You know, I just wanted to hang out and sleep and whatever. So I did, I, I went to a lot of the sales with him. This is a press release that he had, but I went to a lot of the sales with him because they were so busy. That was my only time to actually spend with dad. So did I like it? Not really. <laughs> um, but it was, and so I, I got involved on that level just to spend time with him and go to the sales. And I was probably the little brat sitting there going, God, when's this over? <laughs> Can we go get ice cream? <laughs> so I did not have the appreciation for it that you guys did. But, you know, that was my dad. So you do what you got to do, right? So um, 
it, it, from the house, he moved, there was, there was so much stuff everywhere, moved into a rented building. And then from there, we rented another warehouse in that building. As he went to the first Saturday sales, and, and I vaguely remember some of that, just walking around, going, please. How many of y'all remember the sale under the bridge in downtown Dallas, right here? That's before the, that's before the city of Dallas and TxDOT pushed everybody out because they kept planting grass every month and then got killed by the, everybody attending first Saturday. So we had a question? No, I just remember going. Okay. <laughs> so, so he expanded, just filled up that place literally floor to ceiling, which was, you know, something he was extremely good at. <laughs> so, um, he took out different ads, magazine ads. There's been so many magazines that we found at the building that still had his ads in it. So I think a lot of people snatched those up. Um, just to advertise it and get it publicized. And um, he did some stuff on eBay. They did have a website at one time, so that got taken down. As, as his health declined, the website was not maintained, so that got taken down. Um, and then he moved into a very large building, which you guys know is Computer Reset. It used to be the old Hamilton Air Mart, um, and just there was more space than he possibly needed, but somehow he magically finds a way to fill it up. <laughs> just, I mean, we would just go around there and just room to room, and it just led from space to space. For those who have been there, know what I'm talking about. It just It led from even upstairs, just more and more rooms, more and more closets, another cubby over here. Under the stairs, there's another door filled with more stuff. You well, know. What's and that then, phrase, uh, nature abhors a vacuum? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the U-Haul side. I mean, it just he filled it up floor to ceiling. It was it was pretty crazy. U-Haul required the businesses to be separate, so they put walls up in the building to put U-Haul on one side, computer reset on the other. Then he filled up the U-Haul side with computer reset. <laughs> <It> just, <laughs> <laughs> he had one little office there, and then the rest of it was computer stuff. So I don't <laughs> so when he first moved in, it had this beautiful fountain out front. I filled up that fountain with plants and everything, and we we had all those plants except for one was left it's during Snowmageddon, and Snowmageddon killed the last plant. So we were very sad. We nurtured that plant for years, and Snowmageddon got it. We made sure so. as volunteers that every Saturday we were up there, we watered it, made sure that it, it, you know, did it good. would survive. It did good until that happened. <laughs> so, but even towards the end, there was, we found stuff in the planter. I'm like, why is there computer stuff in the planter? I mean, when I say it was everywhere, <laughs> it was everywhere. <laughs> it was everywhere. So this is a quick glimpse into, that's, that's the other warehouse that they used to have. Um, but just, he filled it up, every walking space. IBM closed out all the stuff that we knew for the PC convertible, PC portable, PC, XT, AT, all that stuff. The junior, the peanut, he was a, a system he really loved. And uh, he bought all that stuff from IBM, bought all the closeout stuff from Compaq. I uh, would get closeouts from schools when they traded, you know, one to e-way stuff, and things would ebb and flow out in that in that parking lot. You can see uh, the billboard over there on the picture. The billboard uh, right up here, the, all the tarps from the uh, all the billboard displays. You know, they're they're printed on huge, big pieces of, of vinyl and tarps, and all of those were used to cover stuff out in the lot. We must have thrown away about what 120 oh, of those at least. So much, so much dumpster space. <laughs> uh, they're heavy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're and especially wet. They've been outside. Ugh. So, do you want to have that so you can go at your own sure. place? Um, but he did, he filled up space. I remember walking through that that bottom picture, walking through there when my kids were five and six years old, and they're like, "Mom, what's all this junk?" I'm like, "Shh, don't let Grandpa hear you say that. <laughs> you know? Don't let Grandpa hear you say that." <laughs> so I mean, there's just so much stuff you can't help but be just in shock. Yeah, it would be processed out for things that could be sold, things that could be sold for metals, things that could be uh, recycled. So the stuff that's in the outside lot would ebb and flow, would come and go. There'd be pictures of it clear, pictures of it half full, pictures of it full, then pictures of it empty. You know, it just, it would come and go. And uh, towards the end, it just, it, it, it came. It, this went on yeah. for years. Yes. Uh, until there was an accident. 
Hamilton Air Mart was a, an industrial building. It was a, an air conditioning company. So it had lots of service bays, lots of high doors, lots of very heavy doors. These, this, uh, in early April 2021, one of the springs on one of the doors broke and the door fell and hit Richard in the head. And then his wife, uh, Monique, was injured trying to move Richard, trying to you know, get him out of the way, trying to get him help. So you had a call, you had two parents down. Yep. And, you know, single mom raising my kids, trying to figure it all out. You know, it was just, it was a lot. So it was a lot. Being a thousand miles away, what do you do? You rely on a lot of people to help. You know, they're, they're, Pastors at church, their friends were helping as I tried to navigate through getting them to the hospital, getting them to rehab. They couldn't go back home because their house was a mess. You know, it was not fit for them to live, so they had to go to an assisted living. So managing all that, managing this, life at home, it was a lot. It was a lot. And then the phone. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Was, uh, people are relentless. <laughs> it was, what the <a> bleep? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his phone just was going crazy. People were starting to hear about the accident, hear about the building, lots of stuff in there. What are you doing with it? People kept calling him, bugging him. Like, that is the last thing he needs right now. So had to have his phone, you know, turn it off, let the battery die, don't charge it up again. You know, just leave him alone. He needs to work on his health, nothing else. The business so, phone went to the cell phone. And so yes. as word spread of the accident and people were trying to figure out, are you open? Are you closed? What's going on with all the inventory? What's happening with all these old computers? And the phone's just going nuts. Right, and I'm trying to navigate that, going, you know what, just leave him alone. <laughs> you know, we got, we we're trying to figure it out. And he was asking me about, you know, who's who's selling stuff at the warehouse? People are selling stuff. I don't know what you're talking about, you know, because I was trying to, that was the first couple of days, just trying to navigate through it. So he did not need that stress, but everybody wanted to know what was going on. So. Then there was the YouTube video. Yes, the YouTube video we had taken down that I mentioned earlier was... Um, just blew things up. Best of intentions, but it just it compounded the issue at the time and a, and a whole week of massive confusion. So, And the phone won't stop ringing. <laughs> and then, and then my phone starts ringing. I'm like, how'd you find out about me? <laughs> and then your favorite person. Oh, yes. We, there was a man named Bill who was trying to help, in his opinion, so trying to help, but it added to the stress, added to the confusion, added to a lot of issues with the, my parents and their business and all that. So He was trying to take control of everything there, all of the inventory, and recycle it for cash. He was telling people he was in charge. Bill was never in charge. So if any of you have met Bill, Bill was never in charge. He thought he was, but he was not. So we had to... Uh, very straightforwardly get rid of Bill. So, and his Suburban that was there. <laughs> Dead in the back. So volunteers yes. pushed it up to the front and Noel told him, hey, it's out front, outside of the uh, fenced in secured area, secured area. Go get it before the homeless people scrap it for everything they can. <laughs> so he, he did come to get it, but. <laughs> So Justin is the person that actually he knew my dad. So he got in touch um, with with me after posting that video. He was looking for me. I was looking for him um, because I saw the video. That was not a fun night because as far as I was concerned, somebody was going in there just trying to sell stuff. So, but he was trying to get it cleared out because he did not know how long we had before it got shut down. So. Um, Made a phone call to him. We talked for about two hours that night, about two and a half hours the next night, and hashed it all out, made a plan. The video got taken down, and we started with the Facebook group and, and putting together a group of volunteers and just working from there to make the liquidation of computer reset happen because it was very clear that this was the beginning of the end for computer reset. We just needed to liquidate the building, so... And then Clint arrives. <laughs> <laughs> and then word of computer reset. Blew up. Nuclear. <laughs> you talk about busy before. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so we had our group on Facebook, and we went from 600 people to over 6,000 people in about a month. 
<laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the only one. <laughs> it was good, but it was definitely overwhelming. <laughs> it, it, it was crazy overwhelming because all the moderators no in the group were like, okay, how do we control this? <laughs> and how do we keep this on track? <laughs> do you have X? <laughs> and it was, do you have this? Where, what's the inventory? Where is the inventory? You know, it's like, there is no inventory. No. We don't know what's there. <laughs> and uh, there's plenty of stories of that we're going to talk about as we go through this. There was no way to do an inventory. <laughs> if you ever saw it, there were, when we get to the dumpster page, uh, I'll tell you right now, there was three dumpsters that were just nothing but direct TV empty boxes. <laughs> so how do you take an inventory around all of this? I, I believe you saw PTSD over direct TV boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I ever see another one, it'll be too soon. <sighs> I even have some in my garage. I mean, come on, really? <laughs> So at this point, a volunteer crew was assembled. You know, let's put an end to the free-for-all and clean up the building because it's unsafe. You know, people were climbing over boxes, <laughs> on top of boxes, going up to the tops of the pallet racks, and the pallet racks were never fastened to the floor. We didn't notice that until about a year and a half in to the volunteer you effort. We looked see and was like, the floor. <laughs> holy crap, there's no bolts holding this stuff into place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so it was just a person monkeying off the edge of the pallet racks away from going like the Home Depot video. <laughs> so the volunteer crew was handpicked by Justin, approved by Noel, and I'll tell you right now, we had some incredibly patient spouses. My wife is like, why in the world are you doing this? And I was like, well, number one, it's, it's something to do. It's really an awesome place. And it was something to do during COVID. And as my, my son said, Mom, I found my tribe, you know. And we made friendships that, you know, we, we still, you know, I'll, I'll go over to Kevin's house. He'll come over to mine, you know. And uh, I'm happy to have these guys over for dinner, you know, any time of the week. It's been, it's been great. And we were handpicked because we had specific knowledge that was needed. You know, Kevin was a huge Mac nerd. <laughs> Me, I'm a huge vintage just about anything nerd. You hold up a circuit board and I'll go, that's a such and such, and it was made by such and such, it does this. You know, it's like, so, you know, we were picked because we knew all that. And, and as they found lots of chips and things inside computer reset there, everybody go, hey, Raymond, here's more chips, because <laughs> they knew I ran arcadecomponents.com and, and chips were my thing. <laughs> And so we had all this knowledge base so that when somebody would come in and they would say, we're looking for such and such, you know, after we spent so much time cleaning things and pushing the boxes around and reorganizing, we kind of had an idea where if something was there, where it might be found in the warehouse. So the task at hand, clean and organize a hoard. Now, we didn't have to process the house. That was you and the church. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so three 40-yard dumpsters alone were direct TV boxes. Dealing with mold, mildew, mushrooms, rat droppings, and leaking skylights. Underneath one of the leaking skylights were a few pallets of PC Junior keyboard cables. And the boxes, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen mold and mildew grow so much that it had tendrils the size of pencils going around the box. <laughs> it was like a mushroom farm, but, but there weren't any button mushrooms you could eat. <laughs> so one day we just, all right, we had enough of that. We just started ripping into the boxes and inside the big box were smaller boxes. Inside the smaller boxes were more boxes. It's like a Russian nesting doll of keyboard cables. We ripped the individual boxes open, and inside the pink anti-static foam that's glued to the outside of the box were plastic bags with pristine keyboard cables in them. So we filled up, what was it, three and a half Zenith boxes yeah, half Zenith boxes. full of PC Junior keyboard cables. Throwing, throwing the cables down into the box 
box is. We go one up. Okay, move it out. Do another one. Right on the side. PC <laughs> Junior keyboard cable that goes up on a second shelf on one of the pallet racks. <laughs> and then ends up going to a scrapper because there's so many of them that there's no way you can see it. I think there was, it was like the PC convertible AC switching power supplies in that there were more made than there were computers made. <laughs> no heat, no air conditioning. So during the summer, we would change our hours and go from 7.30 in the morning till about 11.30 or 12. And by then, we are just soaked. There's not a dry spot on us. We're just soaked. We've been sucking down water, sucking down Gatorade. And these magical, magical salt <laughs> tablets that you get off of Amazon that Amazing. have some electrolyte. <laughs> that when you get that brain fog because you've just been sweating out all your electrolytes, you pop one of those about every two hours. And it's like, it replenishes like... Man, gets rid of the brain fog. It's amazing. I learned about them when I was a kid. Mom used to work factory in an aluminum mill, and they would hand them out to the workers at the aluminum mill to help. They were great. That helped us get through a lot oh, of yeah. the summer heat. And, you know, let's face it. We, we were working pretty much for free. We got fed. But you know what? It was, it was awesome because we got to dig through and see stuff that was just, it was like a once-in-a-lifetime thing. You know, everybody watches, watches American Pickers, and we've all had our barn finds where we go out and we're like, oh, man, this is awesome. Well, think of a, a barn find on a warehouse scale. And that's, that's what it was. And, oh, there were three forklifts. None of them worked. 100% manual labor. And like I said, no inventory of anything and paperwork going back to day one. So we removed... I personally packed 25 bags, uh, trash bags, contractor size, full of paperwork from the file cabinets mm -hmm. in the offices. Mm -hmm. yeah. You forgot the live termite. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and the rat droppings. You could get them by the cup full out of the drive room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they had built quite a few nests in there. So. At one point, after enough people asking if we ship, we, we just started talking, okay, well, we'll put it in computer reset packing material. <laughs> and the horde went around the building outside. So how many people in here have seen uh, David Murray 8-Bit Guy's video about the uh, color monitor, the Apple IIe color monitor? It came from this pile outside the building around the side. There were a, Right there. Yes, one of them right on the screen. Yeah, and so we set them up on uh, on a pallet in the back of the warehouse, and one of our volunteers plugged them in and went through and wrote working, not working on labels on them, and uh, people snapped them up. Uh, they, uh, I think all but maybe two of them actually came up and showed a raster. That's about right, and the, and the one, one of the two that was was the most damaged of the bunch, where it was where the plastic just wasn't intact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then the other one that... It was Chris Garpool and I were the ones who did the final testing and wrote the <laughs> notes on them. <laughs> and then the final one, uh, somebody picked up and it had the rotted diodes like the one uh, David Murray yeah. sent. Another interesting thing on this picture, because we talk about PC and you think it's all the computers, there are several mainframe terminal control units, mm -hmm. IBM mm -hmm. mainframe stuff in that pile right there. Wow, yep. Yeah. <laughs> If you look toward the back, you've got that kind of ivory thing. Gene, what was that? That was the storage tech tape drive. That was drive. the storage tech yeah. uh, external tape robot. Okay. Part of one. Yeah, the Yeah, the, in, the innards to it, all the fiber, not fi um, um, carbon fiber uh, beams and all the, the mechanisms were upstairs over the U-Haul side in the big room that always rained in. <laughs> <laughs> And so here they, here they are, lined up, powered up, giving a raster. After years of being outside in the rain and the snow and the ice and the elements. And now the dumpsters. What was the corrected number on the dumpsters, Kevin? Uh, was it 38 or 40? Let me, give me a few minutes and I'll take a look. So all in all, we used... A massive amount of dumpsters, and by far most of them, I'd probably say about 85 to 90 percent of the dumpsters were 40-yard dumpsters. So at $500 a piece, it's not cheap. Yeah, <laughs> it is not cheap. So to give you an idea how big this is, this is a tail of a Ford. If you've seen my truck outside, I have an F-250 quad cab. 
you can take my Ford F-250 quad cab 4x4, big truck, drive it into the dumpster, close the door, and you will not see it. <laughs> it fits inside a 40-yard dumpster. It's, they're massive. They have ladders on them. And we had our share of dumpster monkeys. What's a dumpster monkey? They charge you each dumpster. And then they charge you extra if the stuff is over the top of the lip of the dumpster. And so you could see uh, David in that picture there laying down on top of everything. Uh, he was one of our dumpster monkeys. Kevin did some. Uh, uh, we had uh, Andy, Andy doing some. And we had a few others that would climb up into the dumpsters, rearrange things and stomp things down to where we could fit more in the dumpsters and where we could uh, make sure that we're not going to get charged extra. And then there's the dumpster juice. <laughs> so see this dumpster, how it came off the truck? It slides down like this. Well, when they tilt it up, they have water inside them from sitting. And when they do, dear God, that is some of the foulest stuff you will ever smell in your entire life. So how many of you have been to national parks and gone to the porta potties in a national park? It's worse. It's far worse than that. It was, it was. So when, when the dumpster juice would flow out, everybody ran back away from the dumpster to see where it was going to flow and tried to avoid stepping oh. in that because you don't want to track the smell into your car or the oh, smell home. Bad. So we would try to avoid that area until it dried and we would just kind of just basketball shoot things into the dumpster until it got so full we had to go dumpster monkey it again. <laughs> uh, Raymond, but yes. The uh, final count I've got is 35 and 1,070 yards of track, cubic yards of track. Okay, so I still have the right number in the slides. Yeah. Okay, 1,070 cubic yards. Whew, that's a lot. You're talking old deteriorated bubble wrap because we pulled three big, huge bubble wrap rolls out of the out of the 18-wheeler uh, trailer. And those went to my house because I used them in packing our kegging boards I shipped all over. Then we pulled out another three or four big rolls of pink anti-static bubble wrap. And that was so deteriorated, you'd touch it and pull your hand away to just string to it. And it's like, nobody wanted to touch them. And so we just kind of like grab it from the sides and quickly put it in the dumpster before it gets any more on us. But as we kept digging, we kept finding cool things. There was this drawing of the computer Saurus, only a computer reset. So that ended up on a T-shirt. We found a fire hydrant and all kinds of other things that ended up on the computer reset shirts that you'll see with stuff going around the outside edge. Yeah, the dune buggy. That was uncovered. We were looking at, hey, can we do a raffle for the dune buggy? No. The state of Texas... We had a licensed auctioneer here last night who's a friend of mine. He volunteered his time to do the auction because the state of Texas requires a licensed auctioneer to do an auction. And the regulations they have on that are huge. Well, that is nothing compared to the regulations they have around raffles. <laughs> we looked at that and it's like, okay, that is not going to work. <laughs> so it went to the highest bidder. Shirts, sweatshirts were made. Uh, mouse pads were made. We presented some to Richard, uh, and and just he just beamed. Uh, we had a special event at uh, Dallas Makerspace where he came in and saw all the stuff in the room was stuff that came from Computer Reset that people cleaned up, restored, and had back in full operation. And here you can see Pete Young, one of our volunteers, wearing the Computer Reset shirt. And so uh, let's see here. Um, uh, vinyl records, the dune buggy, a uh, bunch of camera gear, uh, let me see, a big knife, yeah, it was a big freaking knife. We had vending machines, the Coke machines, uh, tape decks, tubes, uh, video recording, typewriters, and arts, and art supplies. Sewing machines. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> so a variety of things, so we put them on the shirts. <laughs> and so we had the meetup August 24th of 2019, and uh, it was at Dallas Makerspace. And um, while Richard was there, what's that smell? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody guess what it was? Rifa! A Model 4P Rifa gave up the ghost. Oh, <laughs> 
So he was the guest of honor, and he took the time to talk with everybody while he was there. And the cleanup continued, and we kept finding more cool things. You know, the I Love PC, My PC Junior bumper sticker, we found all the concept art for it, and all the, all the different revisions it went through. Uh, Justin pulled out a, a, uh, an original Macintosh box. I found it, actually. Oh, you found that one. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, no computer in it, but, uh, you know, where do you find the original boxes? They're hard to find. I mean, that was the coolest thing about the uh, Osborne in the auction was the original box. You know, that was amazing. We got paid with food. So if you're ever over in the, on the Garland-Dallas border, there's Rick's Old Fashioned Burgers, wonderful family-run place. And uh, we went in there, what was it, about a month ago, Gene? Two months ago? And I go in there, and Julie behind the counter is like, hi, Raymond! And you know, everybody's <laughs> saying hi. And, and it, was, it was great. We would go there and eat Saturdays. And do you know how hard it is to find a restaurant or fast food place that won't <laughs> screw up an order? Incredibly hard. <laughs> we went through so many fast food restaurants trying to find a place that could get us food reliably and accurately and we settled on Rick's and, and they were wonderful great food really cheap prices mm -hmm. and then the Takiera that was uh, you go down to Plano Road hang a right block and a half down is Rick's go hang a left go up a long way towards the next light and on your right is the Takiera and the the freaking awesome tacos the Mexican street tacos elotes in a cup you know all kinds of great things and so you know we we got our food and then we were disassembling and assembling everything at the same time. There's Fort Andy on top <laughs> of one of the pallet racks. Andy brought in all this wood and put up all these barricades so that we could stack dead monitors up there and other things and get them out of the way to try and get to the more desirable pieces. I actually got a home people to donate that wood that I used for that. Oh, oh wow. That's a feat. And then there's Chris Scarpula surfing <laughs> on what we called Mount Backwall. <laughs> it was a back wall of the warehouse where stuff was just mountain piled up to the wall. And so we would go scale Mount Backwall. And there were some really cool things found back there on that as well. That's where all the compact uh, spares were. Yep. So our task was to clean an area, get the trash out of that, move it. So it was kind of like that puzzle. It's got one missing piece and you're trying to arrange everything in order. That's what it was. We had that empty spot. We would move a piece into that. We'd clean this, move that into this spot, and then we just kept going around the warehouse. Now, we had to open the door we didn't want to open. I was one of the people to help, and it took three of us to open that door. It was so heavy. We had a forklift extension, big, huge, honking, heavy piece of steel that we wedged under the door to hold it open. That was a bit of a somber moment. And inside we found boxes and boxes of Varded 486 motherboards. Uh, pallets of PS2 Model 80s. Those things are heavy when you're trying to carry two at a time and step down over that little lip and carry them over to the uh, other side of the warehouse because we wanted to empty that room. Spools and spools of wire and cable. Some of those sold. Uh, most of them ended up going with the scrappers and they, they sold it off for, for poundage. Uh, that was attached to a room that was filled to the brim with more spares. Okie data spares, compact spares, uh, Toshiba laptop parts, and more. And then we nicknamed that room Narnia because if you go back at the end of the long hallway by the repair room, you open up the double doors, there's a wall. You step in, close the door, look to your left because there's a little light filtering through. There's a passageway through the wall. You step over. To your right was a little door under the staircase on the U-Haul side that led to the upstairs on U-Haul side. Step through the wall, feel your way to the other side of the room, and there's a light switch so, <laughs> and to that room where all those parts were held. So since we had to go through the door to get to it and go through the hole in the wall, we just nicknamed that room Narnia. And there's another door you could have used. The reason you couldn't use that door is Richard had built shelves Locking it. Those <laughs> shelves were built by compact 386s with oh, pieces of wood between them. <laughs> <laughs> So you had PCs stacked up with wood between them and then stuff put on the shelves. It was pretty wild. We weren't 100% accident free. Jonathan, stand up and take a bow. <laughs> so I had a deck of 
terminal, it was one of the newer ones, sitting on a, a little table at the end of the, the first row of pallet racks that were, uh, or the, the middle row of pallet racks. And all of a sudden I hear this, thump. The, the monitor fell down, hit face first on the floor and imploded. And that was the thump. And I was like, what the heck? Because I wanted that terminal. <laughs> and I look over and I see Jonathan with this look on his face and he's like this. I'm like, what the heck just happened? There were some pallets up there, and the pallet fell, hit the terminal. The terminal hit the floor. Well, Jonathan was, the pallets went out over the edge of the pallet rack. He stepped at the edge of the pallet, and it went down. He went down with it. And at the point I figured out he went down with it, I'm like, screw that terminal. Are you okay? And that's, you know, that was a crazy thing because, you know, when, when you're old like us, uh, you know, you, you have this problem where, and I thought I had a slide you in here on do. that. You uh, do. Where you get up out of bed wrong at our age and you're like, oh God, what happened? <laughs> this kid falls from the, the pallet, top of the pallet rack, lands on his feet like a cat. Like, <laughs> I meant to do that. <laughs> uh, so that incident is why I built all the scaffolding and railings up top. Yeah, and that's why we also had rules in place that said the only people that are allowed to climb the pallet racks are the volunteers because we didn't want somebody, John Q. Smith public, off the streets coming in and, and digging through the warehouse and falling off one of the pallet racks. Right, huge liability. Really emphasize what was connected and what wasn't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> At that point, some of the pallet racks got fastened down up at the top, too. And then... There was a server that was piled on top of a bunch of servers, on top of a rack at the very front room of the store. Now, to the left of this is a SCSI scanner, and on top of the SCSI scanner was a, and this was all wrapped up in uh, saran wrap, was a bundle with the cables, the power cable and the SCSI cable, so it's an uneven surface. Somebody goes, I want this server underneath it, so he stacks this one on top of that unstable surface. I walk past the rack, okay, just like this, and I feel something, and a big crash behind me as that server came down and just brushed the back of my hair on the way down. And I was like, holy sheep dip. So somebody made us make another rule. <laughs> So, you know, all the rules that we had, you know, like you got to wear proper shoes because somebody showed up in sandals and we had, we made him leave. Well, actually he asked his wife to go to Walmart and get him some shoes. So she did. We made him put on regular close toed shoes before we allowed him in the warehouse. It was a liability to have open toes in a warehouse. I mean, with all the dirt and rat droppings and everything else, why would you go in there with open toes? Gross. And so we made another rule of, Safety belongs to everybody. If you move something, make sure you move it and, and you put it in a way that it's not going to come crashing down, almost hitting Raymond in the head. <laughs> Best part was I was doing an introduction when that happened. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> How long between the time it was balanced and the time it fell? Right. Um, it, was that, it was that day. Yeah. It, yeah. Was basically it wasn't just a minute or two. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> So, you There's know, falling you're off the pallet rack when you're a kid, hey, <laughs> and getting out of bed wrong when you're my age. <laughs> I'm making Jonathan turn red. <laughs> All right, then things shut down. They shut down hard in Dallas County. You know, our uh, county judge, boom. Everything shut down, limits on how many people could be in place. At this point in time, Justin's employer said, okay, you're part of a team that's responsible for service delivery to the Fortune 500, and you're an extremely important part of this economy. So they paid him to stay at home and lock himself in and isolate. They paid him well. So at that point in time, nothing was happening at Computer Reset because nobody could get in. So Justin said, hey, Noel, why don't you make Raymond a key holder? At this point, I became a key holder and took the pricing role and uh, filled in for Justin, and we started continuing the cleanup. At that point in time, we still weren't open. You know, this, we were like, it was just such a mess. And from there, 
it took us about six weeks of hard work and we were actually at the point where we wanted to open and Noel's like really we sent you pictures right I was stunned I was like so quickly <laughs> <laughs> we sent her pictures she's like holy crap I mean, it was... they worked hard they worked hard so we're in the middle of COVID trying to figure out life right and we have to figure in out here. how we can get people in but figure yet, out the rules and be compliant not with tick Dallas off the County. County judge. Right. And don't bring attention to ourselves and have limited people and you're spacing out. And We're already on, certain... on the radar of the city who's after us to clean up the backyard, <clears throat> paint the stripes on the parking lot, paint the front of the building, trim the bushes, fix the hanging down part of the, of the ceiling under the carport, and a bunch of other stuff they wanted done, like fire extinguishers, fixing ceiling tiles. And COVID actually helped us with that regard. I'll get to that in a bit. But we had to figure out how to limit people in. So we set up a registration site. Little did we know what kind of can of worms that would open up with people. <laughs> FOMO, the fear oh. of missing out because we were letting locals in first. Well, that's because we were trying to figure out how we could build this registration site, get it to work. And so we beta tested with locals because let's face it, our rats that are closest to us are easier to handle than rats that are furthest away from us when we're doing our little experiments. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, uh, Kevin built the website and hooked it up with Facebook API so that you had to be a member of the group in order to be able to, to go in and sign up. And, um, it kept us within all the numbers that the county had us under for restrictions based on how many people we could bring in and do it safely along with the number of volunteers for the square footage of the facility. Lots of things to consider. Yes, it was a lot of moving parts. And so we had our rules, and Kevin loved to read the rules out to everybody. <laughs> so we are 100% mask and social distancing environment. And, you know, you would get the people that are like, oh, I'm not no sheeple, I ain't wearing a mask. And like, okay, go in there and breathe the dust, the, yeah. the mil mold and mildew, the, the rat feces, and everything else you want to breathe. Oh, I'll wear a mask. <laughs> Actually, it was even simpler. Okay, you don't want to wear a mask, you don't get in. <laughs> Man, it was, it, was, it was pretty rough, but once you explain why masks were, re were required in there, it was, yeah, it was because of COVID laws, but, you know, you put some rationale behind it about how filthy the place was inside. Even after we cleaned everything up, it was still dirty and dusty and nasty in places. There were some bathrooms we never touched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they were not touched. We didn't even shovel it out on the very last day when we shoveled everything else out. <laughs> All right, no neck gaiters. Had to be a proper mask. No masks with exhaust valves. No protest masks, which is just mesh. Uh, you know, we gave masks away. No, no sandals, no flip-flops. We had somebody who wanted to try to wear flip-flops, too. And uh, we just... Put, put rules in, but the problem is is that we had to keep adding rules. One of them was no testing except uh, at the test cent, uh, bench in the warehouse because there were metal shelves. And somebody put a power supply, a metal case power supply, on a metal shelf, plugged it in, and left it powered on. Now, if you know anything about these power supplies in your computers, that if you plug them into an outlet that's got the hot and neutral reversed, you're going to have probably about 85 volts AC that you're, when you touch that shelf, you're going to feel it. Luckily, it wasn't miswired, but still, that's a major safety problem. And so we, uh, we, we got everything in, and this also allowed us to track attendees in case the authority said, oh, we need to do contact tracing. You know, our attitude was, you want the data for contact tracing? Okay. You want the data for something else? Get a warrant. You know, because you know, we, we didn't want to give everybody's data away. I mean, we were entrusted with your name and, and, and the contact information. And then we opened it to locals first, then to uh, Texas second, then TOLA, then everybody. We did it at a stage so that we could see how everything went. And we had a number of people who were locals. Uh, raise your hand, Serge, you who were frequent flyers that uh, if somebody didn't come, we were like, hey, we got an extra spot, you want in? And he's like, sure. <laughs> but we did have our fun. There were a lot of Radio Shack surprise packages. We had stacks of these boxes. And so how do you get rid of the smalls? 
You know, there's little, lots of little film canisters of screws, nuts, and bolts, and little cables, and PS2 and RS-232 adapters, and Mopar piston rings, and <laughs> 128K PC Junior memory cards, which there were more of those, I think, than were, were PC convertibles made. Um, all these things were dumped in to this and taped up and put on shelves, and people would grab them and just to see, you know, hey, what's in it? You had floppy drive cables and other cables in it. So, I mean, there was some cool stuff in there, but there were also some surprises. You know, that, that helped us get rid of a lot of smalls out of the warehouse. So, you know, that was fun because everybody looked at that radio shack. Oh, man, these are cool. I remember this when I was a kid. I'm grabbing one. I'm grabbing, can I grab four? Yeah, grab four. We didn't care. But we did have our pranks. What happens when Justin's friends leave a U-Haul backed up to one of the doors, close enough that the homeless couldn't get in to take anything, but... They left the back unlocked. <laughs> well, we loaded them up a pallet of PC convertible switching power supplies. <laughs> and they come back, and Justin looked at it, and he just laughed and shook his head. And his guys goes, I guess we have to take them, don't we? And he goes, yeah, they're already in there. <laughs> And then uh, the hydraulic press that Justin had his name on that was in the warehouse sat, sat there forever. So my son trolled him, and, and uh, we, we listed, my, listed it on the uh, Facebook group as sold. <laughs> oh, that, that torqued him a bit. Uh, hiding an Apple IIe and a Model M keyboard in one of the dumpster pics that we posted to the group. <laughs> Bringing a bunch of really crazy items out into a, uh, another volunteer's trailer. Uh, <laughs> I had a bottle of water. I poured it on my son's car tire. And, and then Pete goes, hey, David, somebody took a leak on your car tire. He rushes out there all mad. <laughs> oh, and then uh, smart aleck answers to stupid questions. It's, it's over there by the crate of Apple Ones. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like uh, the bicycle in the basement of the Alamo. <laughs> but we're also helpful. You know, our job is to empty a warehouse. So when somebody got a printer, we'd go over and we'd find the serial card for that printer or extra printer ribbons that we knew where they were or cables or printer paper. And we'd put it with their stuff in their pile. And they were like, I didn't put that there. I'm like, yeah, we did. <laughs> What's that going to do to my cost? Uh, pff, just make a pile. Well, you know, it's it's all cheap. When I found my first floater and gave, went back and gave me a bag of pens for it because I didn't have any. Yeah. And I brought you more pens yeah. just this last day. Yeah. <laughs> so I took a whole server rack with me, a compact server rack. And then next time I come, Raymond comes to me and he's like, hey, you took the server rack, right? Yeah. Okay, here's a, what was it, a shelf, like a for you shelf. Yeah, and then the box of blanking plates. Oh, yeah. I still have that. I still use those, by the way. I switched them out. I just stacked the PS2s, and Kevin, the next time Kevin brought me all the documentation for the PS2s. Yeah. It's our job to empty a warehouse, and we, we tried to be as helpful as we could to get people the accessories they needed to complete their finds. Because, you know, let's face it, documentation's hard to find. You know, and when we, when we can find stuff that's cool, you know, we try to get it into the right hands. And things are flying out, but we did have a couple of your eyes are bigger than your stomach instances. <laughs> One of which were uh, two gentlemen from the Texas Panhandle that I never knew how much you could really truly Tetris into a Prius. <laughs> but they, they overestimated. Their eyes were bigger than their stomach, and they left behind a few items. So we just put them back in the warehouse. I was like, do you guys want to come back for these? And they're like, no. So we put them back in the warehouse. <laughs> it's like, okay. We'll just put them out there, and somebody else will grab them next time. But we did have some really cool Tetrising jobs. Wow. You know, this is uh, this one was really cool because Andy did a lot of this. This was the one where the guy was getting so much stuff and he didn't load it himself. And we were like, <sighs> "Dude, we want to freaking go home. Why don't you load this stuff?" <laughs> and so Andy's out there. All right, give me this. Give me this. He's barking orders. Like, give me this. Hand me this. Hand me this. And Tetrising all of it into the van and got every single freaking thing in that van except for one space. Because what happens when you put the last item in when you're doing Tetris? <laughs> so we tried not to fill that last spot. <laughs> 
And then we're finally off the city's radar, you know, because of COVID, they didn't want to come out and look at the buildings. They looked, drove by and looked at the outside and saw that we did all the stuff outside what they wanted. So, you know, there's a long list of stuff, but they didn't come inside. They'd seen before that we put the exit sign uh, lights all up and got them all working, and they saw that we had fire extinguishers, but they didn't come back and inspect all the ceiling tiles, thank God. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I that was another them pictures rule. And they, were, they were happy with that, and I was, thank God. <laughs> there was another rule, another Dallas. condition of, you know, can I take pictures in here? That we say, yes, but no pictures that include any of the ceiling tiles. <laughs> the last thing we wanted was a picture out there showing some ceiling tile half fallen in and get the city back in the building, you know, going, you need to fix all these ceiling tiles because we did not want to fix all those ceiling tiles. So once we were off the radar, yay. But the city wasn't all the problems. We had a lot of homeless problems with people coming in and breaking in and stealing things. So the front door was crowbarred open and they took stupid things like costume jewelry, old dead cell phones that had no value to them whatsoever. They couldn't even be used on current uh, towers. Uh, June 2020, they broke into the trailer. You know, they, I, mainly on the trailer part, it was stealing some things that they could sell quick for copper or taking uh, and just going in there and sleeping at night because it's someplace dry and, sh and sheltered. Luckily, they didn't start any fires inside it or anything to try to keep warm. It did smell a lot like weed, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that smell like, Jonathan? <laughs> And then the building got broken into, they pulled down the rotted plywood, stole stupid, more stupid items, and had a couple of PC Junior motherboards stacked up on the front counter that they didn't take. I guess they got interrupted. Uh, let me see here. June 2021, the gate was dismantled. So that's the big sliding gate. And uh, that one was interesting. So... We have volunteers like Andy that always drives around with tools with him. And so it's like, grab tools, reassemble the, the uh, straps and everything and get the gate back up. And then we come in one day to see that the tower people took the gate, lifted it up off the tracks and oh, swung it wide open and brought a big truck in. It's like, wait a minute, they don't have license to use. They don't have the easement to use that gate. They're supposed to use the front gate where they have their own lock. And second off, we didn't realize you could just lift the gate off and just open it up like a door. Yeah, I remember standing there watching them do this going, uh, no, <laughs> that's not good. And that's so we not happening. And so we got some master, master locks and some thick chains and wrapped it through the gates, top and bottom, so you couldn't lift it up off the tracks and open it that way again. Crazy. And then we, had, uh, we got locked out by the cell tower people. They put the lock through to where our lock was not in place anymore. And so I called the 800 number and I was like, okay, you got two choices. I can, you can give me the combination so I can get in and reset this and put my lock back through your lock so we both have access, or I'm going to cut your lock off. <laughs> and the lady on the other end of the phone gave me the code. And we, you know, and that whenever we forget our keys at home, we're like, zip, 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 click, open their lock and get yeah. in. <laughs> and then we had the big break-in where they stole the rare items, the, uh, the, PC executive systems and uh, uh, VT100 terminal, a couple other things. And then in May of 2022, they got in and stripped the electrical wiring and, and stripped out the AC systems on the roof, left big holes through the skylights and the ceiling. We found out there were skylights we didn't know about <laughs> because we saw the ceiling tiles removed. We saw light coming up from inside. And it's like, what? And you look up and over and there's a skylight there and it's broken. They came through it and it's like, there's skylights everywhere. <laughs> and then June 2022, they, the little wraps that go around the pole that, that uh, you, you tie your fence to the uh, poles with were clipped. And so we had to go to Lowe's and Andy's got his uh, ratchet straps and we're ratchet strapping the fence trying to pull it over so we can stretch it enough to get it to fit and reclip it. So yeah, lots of crazy problems. And then transportation wasn't quite what you thought because there was a box fan and then we discovered a uh, Chevy Nova 2, and we uh, discovered a, uh, the dune buggy. There was the big 18-wheeler trailer out back. 
And then we found more than just vehicles, there were a lot of drawings and uh, schematic diagrams and models and other things of aircraft that ended up in museums. And there was uh, uh, the, uh, the Homeboy Transportation System, Homeboy Delivery Company, where one of the guys that came down uh, lived in uh, central uh, Kansas, and he was going to go to Kansas City to visit his parents for Christmas. So he volunteered to take up the uh, big VTR unit that the TWA Transportation Museum needed. And so he took that up home with him, and then when he went to visit his parents, he took that over and, and got a guided tour from the museum. Uh, uh, was it the manager, uh, collection manager? Yeah, the archivist. Archivist. Uh, went through and gave him a personal tour of the museum. So, I mean, it was cool to see how these things went around. And, and I found stuff that uh, I donated to uh, John Hardy at the National Video Game Museum. You'll see uh, a couple of marketing items from the PC Junior, the postcard and the puzzle underneath the glass case where the Junior is. And on the wall where the uh, computer store, you know, all sales final, closing, you know, all, everything must go. There's the PC Junior banner with uh, Charlie Chaplin on it. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, from one of the things from Computer Reset that I ended up with was some power supplies and keyboards. And they uh, had a keyboard die and the power supply die in the PC, IBM PC that's out there that was running Oregon Trail. So I put a new power supply in and gave them another keyboard. And then that system was back up and running for people to enjoy dying of dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Chevy Nova 2. Had... Uh, Lots of food trash and really gross stuff inside. To be clear, in the picture earlier where we saw the parking lot, it was in that parking lot covered by one of those tarps. tarps. And it had I.O. cards and monitors and stuff <laughs> piled all around it and on top of it. So you take the top off, tarp off and you're like, why is this a mound of monitors and I.O. cards? Move the I.O. cards like, there's a car under here. <laughs> <laughs> And then the airplane seats from Southwest Airlines that got recovered in uh, Pacific what? Yes, uh, Pacific Southwest Airlines or PSA fabric. PSA fabric because Kevin used to work at that airline. <laughs> so those are in your house? Yep. You, yeah. Oh, nice. wow. Nice. And then we had everything except for the cart. <laughs> <laughs> we had the dead rats, we just didn't have the cart. <laughs> And we couldn't have done it by ourselves. We had, uh, there were a team of scrappers that came through uh, at different times, but Ray and Albany were the two scrappers that stayed with us all the way from the beginning, all the way through to the end. And uh, they were the ones that benefited the most. They helped make sure that we got the whole back lot cleaned up, all the, the trash monitors, cables cut, broken, everything. All that stuff got taken to salvage. And when the back lot was cleaned up, they got the, uh, the, the box truck and there was a massively huge diesel engine block back there. And they got that uh, as uh, carrots for you know, finishing the, the cleanup of the lot. And that was cool because that allowed them to get a newer used truck that they could use for their, their scrapping business. And then we had a couple other teams that came in at the end, but they were choosy beggars. You know, if you go to, to Reddit, they have slash r slash choosy beggars, and you hear all these stories of like, people are like, really? Come on. <laughs> but taking our tools too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and my magnetic sweeper mm -hmm. that uh, came from Hazard Front Tools. <laughs> but. No, I'm good now. But we had two other teams at the end, but we gave our preference to those that uh, danced with us. And they were great. And here's some of the items, like I said, that was donated. The uh, IBM Personal Computer, I um, think uh, David ended up with that one, and it's at the National Video Game Museum. Over on top of U-Haul, I found a box with a bunch of stuff in it that had the buttons, and those were over at the National Video Game Museum. Richard had an eye for things, and one of the things he realized that most people didn't is that the marketing items were going to have value one day. They're the items that disappear. They're the items that the trade show swag that's sitting in your desk and you're like, yeah, I don't need this anymore. You throw it away. There's, there's so little of it left that, uh, you know, that's great things, great museum fodder. And then the item, uh, the 7496 executive workstations, <laughs> the infamous paper clip. So, <laughs> The, I'll tell you, we and Noel hold no ill will 
for what happened with that executive workstation. Because, and I looked through what David did in his troubleshooting, and I would have done the same thing. The power supply is a very strange one in that it monitors the current draw to the monitor. When you turn the monitor on, that current pulse activates a circuit which turns on two relays, which turns on the hot and neutral lines going to the computer power supply. It's a really oddball design. So I could see where he made his assumptions and, and tried the paperclip. Others, we talked about the TWA Museum, the Vintage Computer Federation, Museum of Flight, um, IBM Museum, uh, a lot of different museums. Uh, uh, the uh, System Source Bloop Museum received a variety of items from Computer Reset. And then some of them were shipped, some of them, Andy, Bless your heart. He just, he would be he like, I got to go to Virginia to go check on my other house. And he would just load his truck down and make stops on the way. Uh, three or four trips like that. Yeah. We also took stuff out to uh, David Bean. Uh, yes, at the IBM Museum. My dad did that solo. Oh. Nonprofits got involved. So Goodwill got a lot of picture frames. We, all the hand tools that we found went to Dallas Makerspace. Uh, we had a nonprofit that a couple of uh, my former coworkers at Cisco, uh, I say former because I'm former Cisco, they're still there. They had a nonprofit they started to help get laptops in the hands of nonprofits. They took a, a whole slew of the newer HP laptops and power supplies, refurbished them, and got them into their hands. The art uh, an art collective, artist collective came and got all the frames and the glass and framing tools and things. Free Geek from Minneapolis came down with two 26-foot U-Hauls and took all the PCs, partial PCs, parts PCs, cables, expansion cards, and all the remaining laptops. And then we got down to one last push where we invited LGR out so that he could speak and do a follow-up to his video. David Murray put his Apple One replica in a box so we could <laughs> troll people. We switched to our all-you-can-eat pricing. And then we thought the last PC Junior went home. So LGR signed it. Uh, and, and while in town, our visitor, Epictronics, went over to visit uh, David Murray at his studio for the la uh, last signature. And we really thought that was the last PC Junior. Uh, until the cleanup when uh, Jose Darris, one of the frequent flyers that were shopping, he came in to help clean up and moved two printers that nobody moved forever. And look and lo and behold, two more PC Juniors. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, June 18th, 2022, we filled the last dumpster. We had our last lunch with a group. Andy took his dr truck and we made a video of him driving his truck through the warehouse. <laughs> And the building went on the market. It's now been sold to a construction company. They took the, uh, the, the rock and the, uh, the, the overhangs off the front of the building and side of the building, uh, painted it white, and it, the construction company took it as is, and they're rewiring it. They're taking care of the termite issues, and they're going through and fixing all the AC units and, and re redoing the whole building. So it's gone to a new home. New owners. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you to everybody whose pictures and what's that? Uh, some of those runs to Goodwill were double van. Yes, yeah. they were. There were. Three vans of clothing that went to Goodwill and costume shop. So we had a lot of pictures in here and, and lots of videos and people that helped uh, me get all of this together. So it's just a quick thank you list for everybody there. And we're at time, but uh, if there's nothing else in this room, is there another session coming? No, so we'll be happy. Uh, they're gonna cut off the video, so we'll, we'll be happy to stay up here and answer all your questions. Thank you, everybody.